The mission team will, particularly the backpack uh, mission team, will be presenting their report a long, long time in the making. I know they're ready to, uh, to report to the church family about um, the ministry there in uh, West Virginia. And so many of, of those folks have told me how much of a blessing that was to them and to be part of that. And so that will be the end of February, the last, I think it's the 27th. All right, uh, February 27th, that last Sunday in February, uh, the mission team, the backpack ministry will give their report. So we're looking forward to that. Next Sunday morning is Focus Sunday, so keep that in mind. We'll have a special presentation from Joy Price, so you will uh, want to mark that on your calendar. Uh, Joy and Sean Price, it will be their ministry in Wales, so she's going to tell it a little bit about how um, the ministry is there and some opposition that she may face. Just so you know, uh, Joy and Sean are still in Wales, so she will not be here in person. We wish that she was, but she will be sharing uh, via video with, uh, with uh, the uh, church next Sunday morning. So that will, be a, that will be a blessing to be able to hear from her and to get an update there. Also, it will be the Heck Jones Week of Offering. Uh, the month of uh, really the month of February celebrates uh, the Heck Jones offering, the week of prayer, and uh, the focus, uh, of course, will be uh, next Sunday the 13th. The women of Piney Grove will lead the morning 
uh, service as, as far as the order of service goes and just to be able to update everyone on uh, the missions of the WMU and uh, also bring your favorite covered dish. We'll have a lunch next Sunday as well. And so keep that in mind and that in certain reminder is on the inside of your bulletin for you to remember that. Also keep in prayer for our Baptist on mission. There is a, a mission rally that is coming up that would be not region two, which would be our region, but region one, which will be in Rocky Hawk. And for more information on that, and if you'd like to attend that mission rally, where our mission team, uh, the backpack ministry, at least um, one of our members from the mission team will be sharing that day uh, for this mission rally. So for more information on that, see Mr. Randy Mobley. He'll sure fill you in and get you on that, uh, get you on that roster and get your head count so we can have a meal together and enjoy that. Randy, what is that date again for that? Do you know? February, 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 February 22nd. So. Uh, we'll be posting a little bit more about that within the next few days just to make sure if anyone's interested in going uh, to that mission rally. Also, as you know, the time for the message of Easter is upon us again. And so we are praying through how we might be able to serve the Lord in this way. Uh, 40 years, um, 40 plus years actually, because we've done so a little bit online the last couple years, has been a tremendous blessing to many in the community and other parts of the state and maybe even so the world. But we are... Uh, right now in the early stages of this, getting our, the families who will be involved with that together. And so uh, if we haven't contacted you about being in the drama, um, know that we will. And if you have not been contacted and would like to be in the message of Easter or to serve in some way, just please see, uh, I think, Danny, uh, Sarah, myself, Jason, anyone who is on that mission team. We're, we're trying to get a roster together of how many, uh, how many can serve in that way. And so just make sure that, if anything, be praying about it, that the Lord will speak to us as, uh, as we work through this, uh, hoping to have a, a good and prosperous season uh, this year. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jason with a few uh, ministry, uh, student ministry updates. I want to thank everyone who's been praying for us uh, the last couple of days. Um, some of our youth have been participating in the 30-hour famine. Um, and, you know, I was kind of torn about sharing about this because the Bible is pretty clear about when you fast that you don't go out and say woe is me, uh, look at me, I'm fasting, feel bad for me. But we do want to encourage our church family um, and let you know what our students are doing. Um, so we have been, 11 of us, 11 students and two adults and then two other students who are actually at home on quarantine or participating with us as well, have been fasting now for about 24 and a half hours. And uh, we had a lock-in last night, so I have a slight little twinge of a headache. I don't know if it's from lack of sleep or lack of food, but um, it's one of, I will say that last night I slept the best I ever have at a lock-in. Uh, this is just a little extra. Um, two weeks ago, me and Tyler were starting to move a couch to give to the bazaar, and I said, we got a lock-in coming up. It's going to the activity center, so that's my bed for the lock-in. So I actually didn't have to sleep on the floor. So uh, we've had a good time, though. Um, one of the things we talked about last night is fasting is just a physical activity if you don't focus on, on the spiritual reason of why you fast. Uh, we didn't want to just come together and uh, not eat for 30 hours just to say that we were practice in a spiritual discipline, but not do anything spiritual. So what the focus of our fast was on prayer. Um, one of the, some of the reasons you may fast are, um, you know, for uh, seeking God's wisdom and direction, maybe for a decision in life or praying for a situation that's going on um, in your life or in a family members or friends. Um, and what we have done is we have focused on praying for the mission of the church. So we spent a couple of hours last night um, with eight, eight different slides that had um, three or four prayer points on each slide about how to pray for the church. We spent time praying for Piney Grove, um, for how God would have us serve in our community, um, how God would have us serve our people, um, and how we relate to each other and to the Lord. And then we spent some time praying for the church in America that um, the American church would um, stand firm on the word of God even when it's not popular in culture. 
um, and a few other things for the American church. And then we spent some time praying for the church around the world, for missionaries, and then particularly for different countries where, um, where there's some hostility toward the gospel and toward believers. Um, so we spent a good time last night uh, praying um, while fasting uh, for the mission of the church in the world. And it's been good. Um, and we're going to uh, end the fast this afternoon. We're going to travel to Greenville to the Buffalo Wild Wings and have a nice meal um, together. And we're all looking forward to that. But it's been a good time of our group uh, building together and also uh, uh, just understanding the importance of praying um, for the church in our community and, and in the world. And a couple of other things um, coming up. I do want to remind our kids, our family with families with kids, that the Century Kid deposit is due next Sunday. Um, so if you have a student in third through sixth grade, now that will be this summer. So it will be rising third graders through graduated sixth graders. Um, if you want to uh, sign up for Century Kid, that is due next Sunday. Um, so make sure to, uh, to get that to me. If you have any questions about that, you can call me, text me, come see me in the office. Um, we will uh, tell you all you need to know about what Century Kid is. And, uh, and what we do there, and we're looking forward to that as well. Also next Sunday, um, the deposit or, or the money for Winter Jam is due for our youth. Uh, we will be going to Winter Jam in Raleigh in, in March, uh, but we're gonna pre-order our tickets this year. Um, but we're going on a Saturday, um, so it's gonna be extra crowded, and we wanna make sure that we um, are able to get in, so we're gonna pre-order our tickets. That's due next, uh, next Sunday as well. Um, that's $35. And if parents or students who have any questions on that, again, uh, feel free to come to me, ask me about it. I'll tell you all you need to know. And then one last announcement that we have on February 25th will be our first fundraiser for our Century Kid in the Future Camps. Um, that's going to be a pancake supper here at the church. And we have some flyers for that. If you'd like to get some and pass them out, we've shared it on social media and all of that, but uh, we appreciate um, the support that we always see from our church family and from our community um, to send our, our students to camp and to send them on mission. So uh, we thank you for that. And again, uh, if you have any questions about any of that, feel free to uh, get up with me and, um, and I'll share more with you about it. But thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be able to um, share on mission, be on mission with you, Lord, and uh, the many things that you have entrusted in our care, uh, Father, and to be good stewards of them, Lord, namely the gospel, Lord, we pray that we will be faithful, uh, Lord, uh, we just pray for the many different endeavors we have uh, here at the church, Lord, it, it is not our doing, and we don't boast in what we are doing, we boast in you, we're thankful for our faithful men and women who are serving you here in, in Newbury and across the, the world in some way else or, or another, Lord, we Thankful for our students, Lord. We are thankful that uh, you are leading and teaching them uh, through uh, Pastor Jason, Lord, and you are leading and teaching them through your word as they prepare for the law, Lord. And uh, we are just, uh, uh, we, we just want to give you honor and praise with everything we do, the work of our hands, Lord, may it be to you, may it be to your honor and your glory. And now we ask you, Lord, as we, uh, as we continue to meditate upon your word and meditate upon the song of meditation, Lord, we just pray that. You would, lead, you would lead us further, Lord, to your place of worship. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing Jesus? <laughs>
those uh, uh, being dismissed for Children's Church, you can be dismissed at this time too. All right, our Bibles, let's turn together while we remain standing to Deuteronomy chapter 1. For those who have your Bibles, we will be in Deuteronomy chapter 1. The words will be on the screen as well. The word of the Lord says, beginning at verse 9, At that time I said to you, Moses speaking, I'm not able to bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your head. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and I have set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties and tens, and and officers throughout your tribes. And I charge your judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with you. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and great alike. You shall not be humiliated by anyone for, or intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at the time all things that you should do. May the Lord Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word of the Lord. And please, if you will, be seated. Now today's sermon will deal with the importance of encouraging and uplifting leadership within the body of Christ. In fact, I've entitled this sermon, Leaders Need the Lord. In one way or another, the strength of the Lord, or just quite frankly, some people in leadership today, even pastors, need the Lord. And some might even be in the world today in some ministry Pastors and leaders who are are not even saved. Can you imagine? Leaders need the Lord is the topic of today's sermon. But if I was to tell you the number of conversations that I have had over the years with pastors who have been blindsided by immature Christ followers or church members, if I told you the amount of stories that I have heard by pastors being blindsided, it would amaze you. I have heard stories from pastors and elders or leaders or overseers that if I was not careful, I would be judging the people who came against them, saying that they were unsaved or unregenerate. What is my reasoning? My reasoning is saved people shouldn't behave the way that some Christ-professing people act. Now one story, I'll share one one case with you, one story I remember goes like this. One Sunday morning, the pastor came back to his his church where he was pastoring over. He was overseer and he had spent a little time away with his family. And this was his first Sunday back from being away for a little bit. He walks in the door. Now he's a pastor at a a Southern Baptist church, some all Southern Baptist church, kind of similar to this. He goes into the church after being out of town for some time, and a, a young member, young member, said to this young pastor, said, I heard that this was going to be your last Sunday. And what they found out was that the deacons had met sec- secretly and 
The leadership had let, met secretly and decided, well, it's time for him to go. Of course, this was news to him without warning, without provocation, without correction, without, without admonition. The pastor was simply let go because the church patriarch didn't like him. See, I could stand up here and I can act like I'm super spiritual all day long and I can pontificate or I can boast about how spiritual I am or how close with the Lord I am and how, how much time I spend in Scripture, how much time I read the Bible or pray. To, but, but if my actions don't match my proclamation, then I am simply just being a hypocrite. And so, Lord, please forgive me if I have judged incorrectly but I can't understand what goes on in the heart and mind of some people who claim to be of Christ. And I think I have figured out at least one or three and maybe a combination of all. It is either one of three. It's immaturity. It is self-righteousness. Or it is just plain lostness. Now, I want to spend a few moments with you this morning. Hopefully, you will allow, allow me to speak freely. And some of the sermon this morning, I, I don't know exactly why the Lord led to this particular section, but it's definitely for somebody here today. So I want to share a few verses with you this morning from Deuteronomy and I want to share with you the importance of calling men and women to lead and to serve the Lord well. In the world that we live in, the church needs to be the one place where the outside world doesn't look in and see division and disunity. We will look at what it means to support one another from leadership to lay ministry. Let me tell you this, one person cannot and should not carry any one local congregation of Christ followers by themselves. There are churches that I know of where there is maybe one or two people who do almost, almost all the work, all the support, all the serving, all the financial resources are coming from these one or two people. I wish that we could demolish this old saying in reference that I've heard time and time again until I, I get sick of hearing it. In reference to serving in the local church, it says 10% of the people in the local church do 90% of the work. You know what that number should be? 100% of the people in the church do 100% of the work. It just blows my mind how a church with over 200 members on the roll have a hard time finding people to fill ministry roles. And I thought and I thought about it. So here is here's what the Lord has been dealing with me about over the past few weeks. I thought and I thought about it. And I think I maybe have found one snippet of an answer. See, we live in a society today, especially in this day and time, that influences and seeps into the thread of the local church. Sometimes there are good influences in culture. Sometimes there are bad influences in culture. And this particular aspect is not good for the health and growth of the local church. And I have searched and I have searched and I have prayed through this. Even in the society that we live in, it can seep within the very thread of the church itself where this idea of quid pro quo is the mode of operation. I scratch my back, you scratch mine. You do for me, I'll do for you. And this idea has seeped into the very core of ministry, I believe. It simply means a. It simply means quid pro quo. You may have heard that in the past couple of years, especially in the political realm. But what this simply means is a favor or advantage granted or expected in return for something. Or if you do for me, I'll do for you. 
in the many years of ministry that I have been in, I see this attitude amongst many people, and I believe it is a detriment to the health of the church. In fact, the reason I mention this is because I've found myself over the 20, 30 plus years that I have been a Christ follower serving Him, I found myself thinking this toxic thought too. Friends, that is not how ministry works. It is not, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. That is not how ministry works. Let me put it in a very simple illustration that I think that we all can resonate with. First, I want to publicly thank our deacons for serving the Lord Jesus. I want to thank our deacons for being faithful men and women who serve the Lord Jesus, who are servants. We have some good deacons here. So I want to publicly thank them for serving the Lord. But I also want you to know that if you are waiting for your deacon or if you're waiting for your pastor to visit you before you come back to church or get involved, may I say that you would be returning for the wrong reason and it is time to lay down that pride. Now, don't you think that I struggled with that too? I struggled with that too over the years, laying down that pride. See, we aren't engaged in ministry to get something back. I don't serve the Lord so I can get something in return. We are engaged in ministry to make much of Jesus and not ourselves. If there's one thing that we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is to be humble. So, Having the right leadership and lay interaction is so important. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that, good leaders will love and support the people. And the people will love and support their leaders. See, ministry is not tit for tat. It's not you do for me and I'll do for you. Ministry isn't, is, isn't tit for tat. It is making much of the name of Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes we don't all get along, do we? Sometimes that means swallowing a little bit of our pride, doesn't it? Now Moses is on Mount Horeb here. He is, some would call this Mount Sinai. He is, he is addressing a new generation of, of God-fearers. He is, he is addressing a new generation coming out of exile or coming out of the wilderness. They are ending their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and now Moses is giving them some marching orders. Next week we'll actually see. Now they're about to move out. Time was drawing near for the people to come off the mountain and move forward. Remember last week we, the Lord had said to the people, you have spent, you spent long enough on the mountain. It's time for you to go. Time for you to move out. Time for you to go on your way. And he reminds them of this covenant in verse 8. He says, see, look out, look Look over the horizon. I have set before you this land. Go in, take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then give that to their offspring after them. Now, before they move forward, though, there is some order of business that needs addressing. This business will involve appointing or delegating people to serve. Delegating or appointing people to serve in the kingdom of God was important back then as just as important as it is today. And what he will admonish the people to do would be to help to carry the load and then we see the Lord God going above and beyond the call. And how does the Lord go above and beyond the call or above and beyond? We'll, we'll see this in just a moment. In verse 9, it says, that At the time, Moses, he said this, I am not able to bear you for myself. The Lord has multiplied you. You have grown. You are here today as numerous as the stars of heaven. And may the Lord your God not only make you as numerable as the stars, but make you a thousand times as many. Go above and beyond. God always goes above and beyond, doesn't he? God always blesses us more than what we ever need. He goes above and beyond and lavishes with his, with his grace. And he says, I, as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. And 
And then he says in verse 12, how can I bear myself the weight and the burden of you and your strife? Now Moses, like many, <clears throat> Moses, <laughs> Moses, like many leaders over the span of history, understand the use of delegation. And I think many pastors and leaders today will do well to, to learn this. Because I've seen so many men and women serving the Lord Jesus and some will try to be the one man show. Will try to carry the burden and try to take on more than what they should. Now Moses says, I will not be able to sustain you on my own here. He obviously learned something from his father-in-law Jethro. Now Jethro gave Moses some very clear to the point um, advice. Uh, he was right to the point without holding back. By the way, we need people in our lives like that too. That would give us advice, godly advice, and, and not hold back. He says this in Exodus 18. He says, what you are doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out. You're not going to be able to do it alone. Listen to Jethro's words exactly as they are described in verse 21 of Exodus 18. He says, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God. They're trustworthy and they hate a bribe. Can't bribe them. Can't strong arm them. And place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Looks like Moses was doing that, doesn't it? And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter, let them decide for themselves. So it will be, what? Easier for you, and they will bear their burden, I like this, with you. The church is to bear burdens together. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people... Also, we'll go to the place in peace. Now, that is sound advice, people. For the ages, and it is certainly reflected in 1 Timothy 3 with the qualifications of overseers and deacons. In verse 10, the Lord has been faithful to His promise. He has kept His end of the covenant. This is the reason that Moses said, I cannot bear you by myself. It's a good problem to have. God has grown the people to a place where one man couldn't do it. And this is a good problem to have. He, he, he has grown the people so much that they needed to have some delegation. Now obviously this is what we would call hyperbole. It's ex exaggeration. And some would say that the people here on Mount Horeb, because at the time they would have calculated the 600,000 stars in the sky. That would be their understanding. Some would say there was millions, and some would, some would say uh, 5 million, 6 million, something like that. But the point is not necessarily on a set number itself. It's another way of saying you have grown to an almost incalculable number because of God's covenant. That's, that's where Moses, in verse 11, exhibits good leadership. That is, that is why people in the church need leaders that, are, that have this attitude like, like Moses does here. And we, we need more leaders in the church like this. What does he say that is so impressive? What does he say that is... That exemplifies good leadership. He says, may the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase your numbers a thousand times more. And may he bless you as he promised you. You ever met somebody who is always optimistic? You never hear them say anything negative. You ever met somebody like that? I have. I can think of a few, few people right here in the church that are just like that. Somebody who expects God to go above and beyond because he is a good and he is a faithful God. Amen? A go, go above and beyond. He will increase it a thousand times more. I, I know what God promised and I know that he will go above and beyond. Church, it would do us well to harbor such ambitious thoughts. 
It's a prime example of a man of God knowing the character of God who is leading the people of God well. I serve a God that goes above and beyond. He has given us so much grace and mercy that he has been lavished upon us. I think I always think of the floodgate of grace being opened and poured upon us. Lavished his grace upon us. And it would do us well to have leaders and, and lay people in the church that go above and beyond. Expecting God to do good in his kingdom, and he will and has. See, a good leader goes above and beyond. See, ministry is not easy. It is not easy to, to be in ministry. But it is enjoyable, and it is rewarding. And I've said this before from the pulpit, I'll say it again, one of the most rewarding things in ministry is to see the people of God grow in their faith. That is the most rewarding thing to see people grow in their faith. But it's not easy. It comes with its challenges. The body of Christ needs all hands on deck with no room for division. And I have heard this said about a few different ministries, and it's not necessarily wrong to say this. Particular aspects of ministry right here at the church will say, well, we need all hands on deck. Well, isn't that the aspect of every ministry that God has given to us? That it's all hands on deck, no matter what we're doing? And what makes more one ministry more preferable over another? We would say, well, it's all hands on deck here, but over here, we will only take one or two people. And it might take one or two people, but does, does that ministry also need the support of the whole church? And although I agree, it is all hands on deck, because we're all, serve, we're all called to serve the Lord. But we don't get the privilege to pick and choose what God is doing in His church. I would like to think that the body of Christ would go above and beyond to serve the Lord in order to make Christ known. We serve a God that goes above and beyond, so we expect us to go above and beyond. We serve a God that goes above and beyond, and we would say, because this is what we know of Him, and this is what we expect of our God. He is a good God. There is a term that is used in ethics. It's an ethical term it is used. I'm going to share it with you and unpack it a little bit. There's an ethical term that means to go above the call of duty. And the term is super irrigation. Now, don't ask me to spell it right here, but it's super irrigation. And it means this. Here's what it means. It means the performance of more work than duty requires. In moral ethics, a good example would be something like this. To go above and beyond. Super irrigation. Irrigation would be that I see somebody drowning, okay, and I don't see any lifesaver on hand, no flotation devices to throw to them. So I myself go out to save them, risking my own life, and I myself cannot swim. Going above and beyond. I'm going out to save them. Now, the example goes to the extreme. If I lose my life while saving yours, did you catch it? If I lose my life while saving yours, I have gone above and beyond super irrigation. But my friends, isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He saved our lives in salvation and lost his. But praise, the, praise be to God, he is risen and he is alive. Dr. R.C. Sproul said this, and I love this quote. I always remember Dr. R.C., particularly for some of the things that he said that were just so rich. 
Dr. R.C. Sproul, who's going on to be with the Lord now, said this. He said, God just doesn't throw a life preserver to a drowning person. He goes to the bottom of the sea. He pulls that corpse from the bottom of the sea. He takes that corpse and puts it on the bank. And then he breathes into him or her the breath of life and makes him alive. Now that's what the Bible says happens in your salvation. The Lord sent his son whose life, death, and resurrection went beyond what is, is, is expected of a holy and triune God. Super abrogation. The Lord didn't have to send the son, but he did. Think about that. Did God really have to send the son? Or was it his nature where he couldn't do anything less but to send his son? Simply put, Jesus went above and beyond. And we must serve and we must worship him with that same motive. I want you to listen carefully. Do you want the kingdom of Christ to grow? That's a yes. Yes. Bear one another's burdens. Now let me further that question. Do you want the kingdom of Christ to grow? Well, the next admonition that Moses says, well, you want to see the church grow? You want to see the assembly grow? Lay aside your bickering. Lay aside your strife. That verse 12 says... How could I bear myself the weight and burden of your, uh, you and your strife? Another word for that strife is bickering, complaining. As you can imagine, with all the people involved, as I mentioned, some maybe 600,000 in the millions, there will be some disagreement. You can, get, shoot, you can get three people together and they'll disagree. Think about this. Close to a million people, somewhere in that range, there's going to be some disagreement. There's going to be some complaining. There'll be somebody who wanted it this way. There'll be somebody who wanted it that way. There'll be somebody who wanted to rake uh, Moses and Aaron across the coals. Yes. But just because we expect it doesn't make it appropriate. Just because we expect division and we expect people to be at odds sometimes doesn't mean it's appropriate. Appropriate. It's like saying, I, I know that I'm not perfect just so I can keep on in my imperfection. It's like saying, I know I'm not perfect so I can keep on sinning. No. Moses says, one man cannot handle all this bickering. Now let me just say this. Sometimes in ministry or leadership, um, leadership doesn't always do what is pleasing to all people. And I understand that. I understand that there might be something that I have done as a pastor that you might not be happy with. Or Pastor Jason or any of your deacons or anybody. And there might be some things that, that you don't agree with. Pastor should have done this. He should have done that. Why are we doing this? I don't understand. But maybe the plea to the people should be Unless there is some gross sin or misrepresentation of Christ, that we are called to press on and serve Jesus anyway. I'm not coming to, I'm not coming to church to worship people. I don't come to church to worship people. I come to worship Jesus and make, make much of Him. And even if I have a disagreement with somebody, I don't like some way that something's going on, I don't, I don't come because of that. I come because I love Jesus. Don't let that one person or person stop you from serving and, and worshiping the Lord. So I want you to hear some instructions. He says, choose from your tribes wise, understanding, experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. Call some men who are wise or sober-minded. Call some men who are experienced and they're not a novice. Notice the language I'm using. They're not a novice who have understanding of the word of the Lord. 
Now, that should sound very familiar with any student of the Bible, as I mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 already and Acts 6 and verse 3. Acts 6, 3 says, Therefore, brothers, pick out for amongst you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who will appoint who you will or we will appoint to this duty. Now, in this particular section of Scripture, he says... In verse 2, it is not right that we, the pastors, the overseers, listen carefully, and do with it what you will. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Serving tables is good. And a pastor that goes above and beyond would serve tables, visit, call, those type of things. Go above and beyond to do those things. Then he says, brothers, pick out good men of good repute, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom. In verse 14, and you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do, we'll do it. So I took the head of your tribes, wise and experienced men. Just as Jethro had give the advice to do, I made them commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and officers throughout your tribe. Now I want you to pay attention. To verse 16 through. He says, Now I charge your judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother. That last part of that is very important. Or the alien who is with him. If we're not careful, we go right over that part. Or the alien that is with him. What does that mean? That doesn't mean some tall gray UFO man. No, just a foreigner. The outlander. Delegation has been administered and that's a good thing. We need delegation. The duties of the lead and leadership of the judges are both military purposes and that for establishing, let's say, domestic or, or, or civil purposes for establishing a law, upholding the law. It was, it was evident that along the way and along the journey that along the way there were some people that Israel obviously was a light to because they began to gather in people that were called aliens. These are people who are not Hebrew and for some reason maybe there are some faithful amongst Israel that was light to them and they decided, hey, I'm going to be a God-fearer. I'm going to be a worshiper of Yahweh. And so they began to join them early on, all the way back. We see it in Leviticus. We see it in, in the book of Numbers that some of these foreigners began to join them and march with them. Now that means that they need to be under the law of God as well. And along the way, here are these God, these God fearers. They're called God fearers. They were picked up and were added to the group. These are people who are not of Hebrew origin but would come to worship the one true God. And so it's important to point this out, that the judges are not to judge them differently because they are not of Hebrew blood. Now, if I was to take this to the church, or maybe a little closer to Piney Grove, I would obviously speak to you about the toxicity of racism. I mean, it's not just a hot, topic today in the world it's I mean it, it exists now and and it did then too I would talk to you about the toxicity of racism I would speak about how God created all humans in his image and his likeness and you know the old song that we used to sing the true this children's song sometimes called a children's song Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. But another aspect I would raise, besides that of toxic racism, would I would raise that of the outlander or the foreigner. You know, the people who are not from farm life. You know, the people who are not from this area. You know, there are enough people in our church or community that are quick to point out if you're not from here. But I got to ask you a follow-up question. How does that affect the gospel? 
How does that affect the message of the gospel? Now, now there's nothing wrong with being proud of where you come from. I'm glad that you're proud of where your, your heritage here. I'm glad you're from farm life. But my wife and I, we're not from here. Sometimes we're reminded very quickly, name dropping here, here and there. We're not, we understand that. We love you anyway. <laughs> Why do I mention that? We're the aliens. Now here's why I mention that. It's good to have heritage. It's good to be proud of where you're from. I'm glad that you are. We're, we're, I'm proud from where, where I'm from. As global as the melting pot has been in the world today, to hold so tight to one's heritage, so tight that no one else can squeeze in, is actually anti-gospel. He says, this is what Moses says, verse 17. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the great and the small alike. So James addresses this too. A rich man comes in and a poor man comes in. If you say to the rich man, sit here, you sit back there, poor man, you're in sin. Or you might say you're from farm life, you sit here, you're an outcast, you sit back there. Guess what? That's the sin of partiality. That's the sin of partiality. He says, you shall not be intimidated by anyone. If someone sits in your seat, guess what? There's hundreds of other seats in here you can sit. I heard a brother tell me last week that they were visiting a church and some man was in his seat and he stood up in the corner pouting because somebody was in his seat. I tell you where, he, he needs to be sitting right here. He don't need to be sitting in a pew. He needs to be sitting on the altar. That's where he needs to be at. In the case, he says, that's too hard from you, you bring it to me, I will hear it, and I command you at this time all the things that you should do. These are good things. These are good things, he says. There's so much more to learn from these last few passages, not to show the sin of partiality, something that James picks up on in chapter 2, or the, the sin of partiality as the heading is. Likewise, you don't let anyone strong arm you or intimidate you either. It shouldn't matter your family name, right? It shouldn't matter your family name or how much money you have in the bank. The word of the Lord is for you too. And the consequences of sin fit the rich and poor, the local and the foreigner alike. The ISV says, never fear men. Why? Because judgment belongs to God. Now, as you can see, I've said a few things this morning that are not necessarily controversial. Maybe you haven't thought about them. I hope you don't stone me as I come down here. <laughs> Maybe things that need to be said. People in leadership need clear direction. Maybe it's more important to uplift and encourage than it is to tear down leaders and lay people who are in ministry. It's important that we need clear direction from the Lord and support and prayers of the people. I wonder, when was the last time that you prayed for your leaders? Now, again, I, I said thank the Lord for our deacons and those who have served for, uh, on the deacon board over the years. We're so thankful for you and for reaching out to your families and praying for them. But how many in here today have actually prayed for their deacon? When was the last time you prayed for your deacon? And said, God used them in a great way. When was the last time you prayed for them or, or your family deacon? Now, Moses understood the dynamic of leader and lay person relationship. The leadership, lay, uh, leadership ministry and those in lay ministry in the church. They were to be united. Why? So that they might possess the land of promise. And then, here's the goal, to be the light to the nations, to the one true God. And we today are to be united under the banner of Jesus to make his name known in the world. I don't know if, um, if I'm speaking to you today. And I do not know where, why the Lord directed me to this particular passage in this way. But he has. The Holy Spirit can be convicting you right now. How would you 
respond? That's the question. How will you respond today? There are a couple of things that are just clear as day. Not only do leaders need the Lord, but we all need the Lord. We all need to be united under the banner of Christ, marching under the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'll ask you if you will, let's pray together as we contemplate these verses before us.